Welcome to the Wildverse podcast, where we introduce you to the wild world of taxidermy, a place where artists and hunters collide. I'm Ashley. And I'm Heather. For this week's episode, we thought we would like to talk about the world of taxidermy competitions. Since show season is just beginning to kick off, we thought it would be a fitting topic for new and seasoned taxidermists alike. We will be covering things like how you enter a piece, how the scoring system works, some of our own experience in the competition room, and more. We're also going to discuss a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes and what it takes to put on a show. Stay tuned to the end to hear a little bit about upcoming shows, too. But before we start this episode, we would like to do a little feature on our Help Wanted post this past week. Today, we are featuring Double Nickel Taxidermy in New Braunfels, Texas. I had the pleasure of speaking with Courtney Shaheen, the shop foreman, and she gave us a really great idea of what type of employee they're looking for in their shop. Yeah, so firstly, they are a great help wanted ad for this episode because their shop owner, John, really encourages his employees to go enter and learn at competitions. He even pays for you to attend the Texas State Show, and if you get a blue ribbon, he sends you to the World Show. I'm not even going to lie. That sounds tempting to me. (laughs) right they are looking for any help they can get if you are completely new to taxidermy they will hire you on as a paid apprentice and teach you all you need to know but if you are an experienced taxidermist they would love to have someone who can just jump right in and help with the workload yeah and she said it's a fantastic work environment with a great boss they're currently a team of seven taxidermists and two finishers and they're a very young crowd with ages ranging from 19 to 44 And she also explained to me that there's plenty of housing opportunities within 30 minutes of the shop for anyone who may be considering living in the beautiful Texas Hill Country. If you would like more information, please reach out to them on Facebook. Again, their business name is Double Nickel Taxidermy. They also have a listing on Indeed.com. Yeah, I have to say, if it wasn't for being a bit tied down here in Pennsylvania, that job sounded great to me. Right? That's a great opportunity for somebody. Absolutely. Especially if you're learning. Right. All right, so I'd say it's time to get into our discussion on this crazy world of taxidermy competitions. I agree. So where should we start? Well, I guess how you enter a competition would be a great place. Firstly, I will say that all state, national, and world show signups can vary, but for the most part, you can either sign up online or through the mail if you want to capitalize on the early registration discounts. But you can always sign up when you get to the show, or at least always. I know nationals last year, they said you had to pre-register. I don't know if they're going to do that this year, but, you know, sometimes the rules do vary. Yeah, they do. Like each show is always different. I always try to save a couple extra bucks by doing the early pre-registration, but there are times that you forget or you don't know what exactly you're going to be taking. So signing up when you just get there is great too. But for nationals, for instance, that would just be, I would be heartbroken if I showed up somewhere and they were like, nope, you had to pre-register. So make sure you read the rules. Right. It's important to check. But then also, I know, Heather, you could probably touch on this topic that it helps the associations when you pre-register that. So then they have an idea of like how many people are coming and what's going to be brought into the show, et cetera. Yeah. It's nice to kind of know your numbers. You kind of know how much to expect. You can get the pamphlets and stuff that everybody gets all set up. Your competition things are all set up. So it is nice if you pre-register, if you want to help out the association a little bit. I'm sure that's why nationals did it so that they could have everything set up and ready to go when the people got there. But one of the more confusing things that you deal with when you are signing up for your mounts, if you're new to this, it's which divisions and categories that you should be writing down on your entry form. Here's a picture of our PA show form as an example. Uh, we send this out in a magazine to everybody. When you're for, I know when I was first looking at it, it is very daunting. Yeah, it can be maybe a little overwhelming, especially if you've never competed before. Uh, Like I told you, Heather, sometimes, you know, because me and you have both competed so much lately in the last couple years, that sometimes we might forget how, like, confusing it might be to somebody who's never competed before. Or even if you've only competed, like, a handful of times, like, it still might be confusing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I guess what I'd first start out with, at least on this sheet, the first thing to put down is a category. Those categories range from like whitetail, game heads, small game heads, life-size mammals, small life-size mammals, like fish, skin mounts, reproduction mounts. Like there's a lot. There's a lot to think about. But when you look at your rules, hopefully that your state association or nationals or worlds has, you know, you can see which categories are down there and which ones are fitting. Like for instance, a small mammal you wonder how do you decide what's a small mammal and pretty much everywhere now is, you know, coyote size and smaller. Right. And then you get, I think, like, you know, like we've been talking about nationals, I think they do a medium mammal now. Maybe I'm making that up, 
but yeah, like so many categories. And what's nice is like, you know, if you sign up in person, obviously you can talk to somebody right there in person and ask, hey, you know, what category should I enter this thing? You can kind of explain what you have. Or you can always call over the phone. There's usually somebody who you can actually speak with. That's what's nice about having so many people involved with these associations is that there is usually somebody you can talk to and ask questions, especially in regards to what how to fill out the form and what categories and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Always call somebody or like you said, just wait till you get there and you can talk to somebody. They'll talk you through it. But Ashley, if you wanted to touch it all on what division you decide to enter, that would be kind of nice. Yeah. So what division to enter? So divisions, usually there is, you know, perhaps a youth division, a novice division, professionals, masters, sometimes masters is called division of excellence. Sometimes professional division is called the open division. There's all kinds of different divisions you can enter. Also, there's a commercial division. And so what division you should enter generally is determined by your experience level, not just with competitions, but your experience level as a taxidermist. For example, I when I first competed at the California show so many years ago, they said because I had never competed before at all, they said I had to compete in the novice division, which you can kind of contest that a little bit, but that was fine with me. So at my first show ever, I competed in the novice division. But if you've been a taxidermist for you know multiple years, a decade, whatever, probably competing in the professional division or open division is a good place to start. But it really just depends on your experience level and what you're trying to get out of the show. What do you think? I agree. I know um, when I first started, I mean, I was only in my first couple years of doing taxidermy. So I started in the amateur novice division myself, which is a great start because if you don't know exactly what all to put into a competition mount, it's a really good start to be like, oh, like these are the things that they're looking for that I need to up my game on or, you know, whatever. So like I went and I placed first and got a best category in novice. So then I moved up to professional, you know, I didn't have a choice at least in, in that division, like small game head, I had to move up. And I think I was ready to move up anyways, but it's kind of nice too, if you aren't sure, like for say you are a professional and you feel like maybe you should be in masters, but you're not sure if you should be in masters, just get in professional, win your best of categories, and then you know it's time to move up, you know, something like that. Because sometimes it is, it's scary. You don't know if you want to make the jump because once you make the jump, you can't go back. Right. That's a good point too. So like you said, you won that best best of category. So then you were required to move up. So that's a good point too, that some associations require you to to compete at the lower levels and then move up as you win stuff or qualify to advance to the next divisions. Some associations you can just, you know, enter any division you want, but some, yeah, like you said, require you to move up. And then usually if you compete in one division, you can't move back down the next year. So like if you took a white tail and you competed in masters, you can't the following year just go, oh, now I'm going to take a white tail and compete in professional. You can't go back down once you go up. Yeah. Yeah. Once you make that leap, you just, you can't jump back down. You go up into masters and think, ah, oh, I didn't do so hot. I'm going to go back to professional. That's not how it works. <laughs> right. So yeah, that can vary so much from like association to association. And, and again, that's something you can like always ask people like, hey, you know, what exactly are the, the rules here? Like, what can I do? What can't I do? Where should I put myself at? And, you know, somebody can give you some good advice if you're not quite sure. Yeah. Yeah. And for those taxidermists who don't really want to get picked apart so much. Um, they do have that commercial division, like Ashley said, that's more for, you know, you just want them to judge pretty much the work that's going out the door every day. You know, you take a deer head off of your shop wall that was going to a customer and literally all they do, you hang it up and they will step back at like 10 or 15 feet. I don't even think they use a flashlight at all from that distance. They just kind of look at your mount and kind of decide, you know, okay, is it, is it a blue ribbon worthy? Is it like, you know, red ribbon worthy? But at least at our show, you don't get blue ribbons and red ribbons. The ribbons are like a different color if you enter that division. Yeah, like you're saying, commercial is a good place to just get your commercial work judged from a distance. It's just another kind of category. But usually at commercial division, you're not eligible for like the bigger awards. It's you know, you're not hands on uh, being judged. Well, that reminds me too, that there is also collective artist division. That's if you and another person or multiple people have collaborated on a mount, you put it in the collective division. Yeah. And that's 
something that I actually learned about last year when we took our collective piece. I assumed that the collect, at least in our state, I don't know about other places. I assume that if you enter something in collective artist, you literally are just eligible for the collective artist award. And then, you know, you got that ribbon, like that was it. But in our state, the collective artist is that was actually eligible for any special awards. Like I honestly thought when we got called up for that mount that there was an error. <laughs> Because I'm like, this can't, this isn't possible. Like this thing isn't eligible. So read through your rules. I felt like a jerk walking up there and getting the awards for this mount because I thought it was wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. what did you guys win on that one? Oh, man, I don't know. Let me look. We won like the Mounted in Alaska Award, the Collective Artist Award, Champion's Choice Impact Award. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think that was all that we won with it, which was cool. Those were, those were cool awards. I had not won a Champion's Choice Impact Award, and I thought they were really cool, so I was excited about that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, there's so many different, uh, what's the word, like variables and so many different like criteria for each category, and it varies so much. And so it can even be confusing for me sometimes to keep track of of everything. So I refer to like the rule book all the time, like in different associations, I refer to like the, you know, the handbook and your Pennsylvania, you guys have a good competition. What do you call it? Like competition rule book pretty lined out. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we pretty much took kind of notes from the world show on most of our things. So we tried to kind of just stick to that standard, but I know when you're signing up mounts, uh, kind of getting back to that, we have the column for our species and our whether it's a floor mount, a table mount, a wall mount, that's always just kind of nice for the the competition chairman and stuff to know. So you want to mark that stuff down as well. Species is nice because it just goes on your little card. Most people are going to know when they look at something what it is, but you never know. Right. That's a good you know thing to indicate too, because of course you get categories like whitetail. Obviously the species are all going to be whitetail, but then you get game head and you could be bringing a zebra, you could be bringing a coyote, any kind of game head. This episode of Wildverse is sponsored by Pro One Performance Chemicals. Pro One specializes in tanning chemicals for the professional taxidermist. They offer a complete line of tanning products to provide you with everything you need to tan your next tide. I really like their Promax tan for my personal tanning projects. They make it so simple. It's easy to follow instructions printed right on the bottle. I actually used Pro One to tan the deer that I won with at Nationals. And I was using this same tan to tan some bobcats last week. It's super versatile. Not only does Pro One have you covered for all your tanning needs, they also sell Pro One Hide Paste, the industry standard in glue. Heather and I both use Pro One Hide Paste on every single mount. We love it. It has a thick consistency that makes it easy to apply to the form, yet it's soft and pliable enough that it can be easily manipulated under the skin after you throw the hide on. If you haven't tried Pro One Hide Paste, I am telling you, you are missing out. And now, as of 2024, you can order Pro One products directly online at ProOnePerformanceChemicals.com. That's P-R-O, the number one, PerformanceChemicals.com. Okay, so what happens once your animal is entered? Once you get past the registration desk, you got all that form stuff figured out. If you've never been to a show before, you're going to want to ask people where the grooming area is. That's where you're going to put your mount on its base if you have to, fix anything that may have gotten damaged in transport, and groom your animal before it's placed into the competition room. Once it's in the competition room, it is hands off and you cannot fix anything else or even touch it. Yes. And so I brought up California before too, and they actually do it a little bit differently. I don't know how many states do this, but they are the kind of association where you place your own mount in the showroom. Oh. And so you place your mount, you can groom it where it's at. But that's, I've never had that experience anywhere else. So typically, like you're saying, you bring your animal into the grooming area, groom it up, and then you give it to like the board members and then they go and place it into the showroom. And obviously they're trying to be super careful with it. You see them walk off with your mount and you're just like, oh, please be careful. Oh, I know. And then, yeah, hands off from there. Yeah, it is scary because once it's like once it leaves. So in our show, you groom it, you get your picture, like the picture of the mount with your little card and everything. And then, yeah, you hand your mount over to the competition chairman and the people working that and they take it in there and place it wherever they got to place it. And most of the time they got to move it around a couple of times because, right. you know, the room starts filling up. Like they got to move things certain places to make everything fit. 
And it is. It's scary. I wouldn't want to be one of those people because that would stress me out. Right. <laughs> Moving people's mouths around all the time. Places like the Texas show, they require you to use casters if you have a floor mm mount just so they can move it around easier too and I think that's helpful that is nice that is nice I just I'm glad that we don't do that in PA just because there are some bases that I don't know like casters kind of wouldn't work that good with them there's certain styles not many but right it is nice then they don't have to worry about picking it up and what if it's top heavy and yeah if it's something like really skinny and tall that doesn't really work quite well for casters. So yeah, sometimes that can be a little tricky. That's another good thing to kind of know before you enter a piece is kind of knowing little rules like that. Like what do you need to have or if there's any special requirements, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. Like you said, checking the rules, just make sure you're doing the right thing. Because I know if you went to a show and you didn't have Whatever they're requiring, like I said, I would be so stressed out. I would cry. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we talked about the grooming area thing. When I bring an animal into the grooming area, I bring like so much stuff. Like I got a whole like tote worth of things and I'm usually fixing some kind of habitat or, you know, gluing something back on. It's nice to bring like stuff to clean off the eyes a brush to brush out the hair. You do like more fur bearer stuff. You probably bring like a, a blow dryer or a pet dryer to fluff them up. Yeah, like I usually bring like a hair dryer or something just because my, my big blower is pretty heavy. But yeah, I mean, I bring I bring everything, you know, you bring drill, you bring extra tools, you bring the stuff to clean the eyes. I always bring extra, I always bring extra dark brown paint because that's typically the areas that, because you know, with mammals, it's like the nose or a paw pad or something stupid gets dinged. So I usually bring the dark brown paint or whatever other paint I might need. Yeah, I, I even bring like my whole airbrush set up just in case. I don't think I've ever had to use it but once. But when you need it, you know, you want to have it. So I bring kind of anything wow. I can think of. Yeah. And here's a little tip for some other states. We did something different last year in PA. And thank goodness to our competition chair people because I suggested it to her. And she, she came through and did it. And it was really nice. If you have the ability to set up a little care package area in your grooming area, it is much appreciated by people because you oh, never know cool. what you're going to forget. So like she brought a blower, a hot glue gun, furniture wipes, you know, Q-tips, like all that stuff. And it was really nice. It was a nice kind of hospitality thing. So other states maybe think about doing that if you have the ability to, because it's super nice. Oh, that's a great idea just to have something because, you know, you always forget something, right? Yes. It, usually it's something always. you always need. Yeah, it really comes in handy to have something there and then you're running around trying to get other stuff. And thankfully, most competitors are there to help you as well. Like if they have something that you need, don't be afraid to ask. They'll probably let you borrow it. Oh, totally. I think every single time I've been in the grooming area, I've asked somebody for something. Like there's always something that I need. You know, I forgot a drill bit or I forgot a, a Q-tip or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. People are there to help. Not everybody. You might run into a couple jerks, but most of the times they're nice. <laughs> Yeah, people are super helpful. All right, so now is the waiting period where I always stress about how I placed. Once your mount goes into the room, the judge will make their rounds and take their time on each piece. They will use a flashlight to go over every last millimeter of your mount. They touch in areas to see if there are any wrinkles, drumming, pins, wet spots, you name it. You would be surprised at the things that you might miss on your mounts, even if you've already gone over that animal a bazillion times. Yep, I've had that happen. <laughs> Have you ever had anything that the judge pointed out to you that you were like, yes, yes, I did. I did that. Oh my gosh. I did it. That nice coyote that I did that's licking its foot. There was a tea pin in it. You're kidding. Oh. Thank goodness. She didn't like, she understood. She didn't. Yeah. She didn't dock me a bunch, but I'm like, oh, like I groomed that thing so much. How did I miss these things? But I did. I've had stuff like drumming that I just had no idea about and they find it and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but so stuff like that, I don't think I've ever left a pin, but I could definitely see myself doing that. Yeah, it happens. It happens. And then I, it's always like drumming and little, like a little tiny wrinkle or something formed somewhere. I don't know how that stuff happens because you do, you watch it and it just ends up something dumb happens. And like, so just a little... A little side piece for those people that don't really realize they may be not comp competed before. If I was in professional and I had something that had like a wrinkle or two somewhere, like I would still take it at that point. 
But just as an example, I've mounted things to take to shows and they end up forming a couple wrinkles somewhere. Like, you know, somewhere stupid up under a leg. I'm like, not taking it. It's not going. That's how, how hard yeah. they go over all these mounts. I mean, a wrinkle for me makes or breaks it. Right. Like they will take, I've seen judges, they'll take like a pen or something or some kind of object and they like start, you know, poking the mount and they were are listening for drumming. Like they are going to totally grope your animal. <laughs> Yeah, they get in there. They check everything and they find things that you never knew you missed. Oh, I also want to mention here that sometimes when you bring your animal into the competition room, because I don't know if we're going to touch on it elsewhere, but you can bring a photo album of some of the work you've done. And then that goes in with the piece as well. Maybe we can touch on that more further on, but that's where you would give the album at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That is a nice thing. If you've made a lot of your own stuff those are handy i've seen people make you know complete books of all the work they've had and it does come in handy because if if you did make all of your stuff how do they know if you're telling the truth or not unless you have pictures there or you know reference pictures to show what that animal is doing which i'm glad i said that brings me to i don't have this in our script but reference pictures i have a bone to pick with people about reference pictures <laughs> What's that bone about? <laughs> so my my take on it, you can find pictures of animals doing many different things. You know, you're going to find pictures. I feel like people can find a picture to almost justify anything that they did in competition. Yes. But you got to look at everything else that's going on in the picture. And you also don't want to pick a pose to enter in competition that's like the exception. Yep. Yeah, like you could, you know, animals will do anything and they can look every certain way. But yeah, I think it's important to kind of, you're, you're making the animal look as realistic as possible. So like if you are mounting an animal that has like a, what do you call it, a huge underbite, that it's going to look funny no matter what. It doesn't really, you know, like you're going to have to have some major references for that kind of situation. Yeah. And I've I've had people show me reference pictures that they're like, see, like this is doing they said it's wrong, but it's doing this in this picture. But like the picture was like of, it was like of a little tiny section of the animal that you really can't tell what else is going on. Like maybe the animal is doing something different and the fin is that way. But in your mount, that animal is not doing that. And it wouldn't move its fin that way if it was doing that. I just saw something on Facebook that's been floating around that a bunch of people are, you know, commenting on with cat claws. And just because you see a bobcat's claws are out and it's laying down, like you, you got to read the rest of the picture. Don't just look at that one thing and think, oh, see, they can, their claws can be out at any time. Well, you know, it looks like to me, the cat's somewhat what people call making biscuits. You know, <laughs> it's pressing down with one foot, kind of curling up with the other foot. So yeah, it's claws are out. Right. Like animals can do everything you know they can do every kind of you know possible pose articulation whatever but yeah a, a judge will know if something looks natural or if it is a natural pose like most judges know that stuff yeah yeah so try to pick you know good reference pictures don't try to find just the one there that you think like ah that that one i'm gonna do that and really catch them off guard because they're probably gonna mark it as being wrong because it might be wrong <laughs> right all right. So, and each show differs as to when you will get your critiques. That's where you find out what your score is and what advice the judge has to offer on your mount. You'll see when you enter a competition room that there are more than just one blue ribbon. There are several blues, reds, yellows throughout the room. That's because of what's called the Danish system. You can think of it as your piece went into that room with a perfect score of 100. Then the judge takes away points for the things that they find wrong with your mount. A blue ribbon is a mount that scores between 90 to 100, red is between 80 to 89, and a yellow is between 70 to 79. So like, you know, blue first, red second, yellow third, etc. Yeah, and anything that scores then below a 70 is just given an honorable mention. It's not given nothing, but it does get like a white ribbon. And I also wanted to add that you can gain a couple extra points for artistic composition, difficulty, or if you made some of your own parts. 
Uh, just like we were saying in the reference pictures, you're definitely going to want to put pictures in if you did make your own parts. But also the most I've ever earned for any of that was maybe like one or two extra points for like artistic merit. So if you go there, like don't expect that you're going to turn like a 86 red ribbon piece into a blue ribbon piece just because it's artistic. Um, I've done some pretty artistic stuff and I was really surprised when I only got like one extra point. <laughs> Yeah, same here. I've maybe gotten like one or two artistic composition points on any one piece. Like you're saying, you're not going to like all of a sudden, you know, bump yourself up five points usually, like unless you do something extremely spectacular. But that is a good point that you can get some extra points and they're not guaranteed. I've heard some people say like, oh, well, I made my own piece. Why didn't I get or I've made my own mouth. Why didn't I get an extra point? Well, you won't always get the extra points for doing stuff like that of course you have to do them well the judge has to determine that you should get awarded an extra point for that that kind of thing yeah yeah it is always up to them and you can kind of when you get your critique sheet you can look at it and see what they wrote down and then it's really great when they get to explain all that stuff to you as far as you know what they liked what they didn't like because sometimes the notes don't make a lot of sense because you're like man what are they talking about like I had my little flying squirrel that I had and the one judge said that you could feel the stitching in the notes and I'm thinking man like I didn't sew anything on this like what are they talking about and then he explained to me what he felt that he thought was stitching and you know it's nice to get your actual critique so don't ever like skip that because you're upset about maybe how you did or you're too busy yeah that's a great point that's another thing so after you know your judge judges your piece maybe after the banquet or sometimes before you get a chance to get a critique one-on-one -on -one with the judge and the judge will go over everything with you kind of say like this is why I knocked you down this is why you got a red this is why you got a blue like this is your major flaw you did this really well they will go over things with you and I've had some really great critiques and I've always learned something in the critiques they're optional but I don't see why anyone would ever not get a critique yeah, I think the only times I've not gotten critiques is when, you know, I've maybe taken them out to another show just to go to the show and I enter it there. Like, I don't need to get the critique. There's all these other people in line. Like, is it typically it's lined up pretty good and you got to wait in line. And um, that's true. You know, I might have skipped them then. But that's another kind of a, a good a good point. If you are waiting behind other people getting their critiques, it's great to follow that judge around to the other people because you learn a lot that way, too. Yeah, so when critiques are going on, just because they're not critiquing your amount at the time, usually you can go in and you can listen in on other people's critiques. And that's, like you said, a great way to learn new information. Yeah. Like, you know, this last year at Nationals, they didn't let people do that. And that was kind of a different situation. But it's typically you can listen in on other people's. And when you do that, you know, it's best to just sit there and not say anything. Like, be respectful, be quiet, just have a, you know, be a listener. But you can definitely do that. People are more than willing to let you do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you definitely want to just be quiet, even if it's tempting to say something. You just, it's not your time. You let that judge and that person talk and uh, figure out, you know, what's going on, what they need to improve or what the judge liked. Another thing too, if you're not happy with your critique, you just got to take it on the chin. Um, you know, you can protest <laughs> things at shows. Uh, most likely it was probably judged pretty fairly. But, you know, sometimes you win some and you lose some. It's up to that person's opinion and their how they read reference. And it's not the end of the world if you don't do well. Right. That's a good thing to remember is that, you know, it is one person's opinion. But most judges are very qualified judges and they're going to give you great advice. They're going to have really good reasons for why they scored you certain ways. And so, yeah, you know, it, it does like hurt to get a bad score, just not do as well as you thought you did. But you just need to lick your wounds and, you know, do better next time, basically. We've all been there. Yeah, exactly. It does. It stings. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just, you just move on and hey, maybe the judge was wrong. Maybe they were right. But you gotta, you gotta always be open to learn because if, you know, people, a lot of people out there that say competing is dumb, you know, only thing that matters to them are green ribbons. And yes, the money you make in your business and how well you run your business is most important. But if you want to learn and get better at your craft, this is a fantastic way to do it. And competing is kind of dumb if you're going to go into it and not want to improve yourself because you're not, you're not going to get anything out of it. If you go there, you, if you want to go to a competition just for people to tell you how fantastic you are and that you do nothing wrong, you're probably going to leave unhappy. 
your expectations might be a little bit skewed because, you know, like you're saying, the most important thing about competitions is not necessarily the awards. Those are great and they're a bonus, but the things that you learn at competitions are the true reason why you should be going and competing. You really are going to become a better taxidermist and improve your work and converse with people, get a great critique from the judge. Critique is where I have learned so many good pieces of information. And that's like on every critique I've gotten, even if it's like a poor critique, I've always learned something. And so that's that should be the main reason why you're competing. Everything else is extra. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's the important parts of it. And it is, I mean, the connections you make, look at me and Ashley. <laughs> I mean, we connected on, you know, social media, but... Right, look at us. <laughs> meeting in person with people and actually becoming friends with people is a great reason to go. If you don't like people or talking to people, you probably won't like going to a convention. Yeah. But if you're the kind of person who like, you know, wants to talk to other taxidermists and converse with other people, yeah, it's not just about the actual competing. You're going to the convention, the competition, there's seminars going on. Like there's, there's so many good reasons to go. You're connecting, you're networking. It's a great place to just learn. Like everywhere you go, everywhere you look, you're going to learn something. So do you have any advice to anyone who competes, Ashley, as far as, you know, actually in the competition room, if you're putting a piece together, since you're just, you know, fantastic, won a bunch with white tails, what would be a good a piece of advice to give somebody competing with white tails, for instance? Um, competing with white tails, uh, to get specific, I guess, I would definitely recommend like, um, you know, use ear liners versus using Bondo. I know there's a lot of people who can do a great Bondo ear, but I would recommend using ear liners. Um, if you want to be eligible for like, you know, bigger awards or like winning a best category, I definitely recommend getting the whitetail on the floor versus having a wall mount. So having some kind of floor piece, I think that super helps. Um, you know, whitetails are hard because there's just so many of them. So doing something that makes you stand out. What about deer capes? Deer capes? So I've heard a lot of people say that you should be sourcing like the most perfect cape that you can find. And while that is true, you really want like, you know, the most perfect specimen that you can find. Sometimes that's not super realistic. Like, so I've, you know, some of my major comp pieces have had like scars on them or like rub marks. And if you make them look realistic, that's not going to hurt you too much. But yeah, finding, you know, a very beautiful cape, that's going to help a lot. Uh, you know, obviously it's just going to look nicer, but if you do have imperfections, you just make them look natural. You know, so if you had like a huge rub mark on the side, like somebody dragged that deer out of the woods, probably don't use that one. But for like minor stuff, you can kind of make them just look natural. Like you could make a scar look like a wound. You can make scar look like a scar or, you know, you can kind of just mess with it that way. But so I don't put too much emphasis on like the capes. But I would say like if you have a white tail cape that has like a huge cut around the eye or like a slice down the nose, sometimes those things are just so hard to repair in a competition setting that it probably is not worth your time. You should find a different cape if it has like a major flaw, like a cut, like something like that. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. You don't want to start out with something with scarred up eyes and you at least want that area to be pretty. Yeah, like if, you know, when somebody's caping out the deer and they've got the whole back of the eye cut that's probably not going to work very well for a competition mount. I agree. And that happens well too often. <laughs> Heather, do you have any advice for anybody who is competing with like a mammal or any kind of life size? You do a lot of that kind of stuff. What would be like your advice? Yeah. I mean, I kind of touch on a lot of what you said too, as far as if you want to do better with it, put it on the table or put it on the floor and try to make it eye level, um, at least the face eye level and pick a good specimen that judge that was talking about the stitching on my flying squirrel was because I had to glue hair back into it. And it's, I don't have flying squirrels all over the place and I had to pay for a permit for the one I had. So when I glued the hair in, you know, the glue was a little stiff underneath there. So when he's rubbing his fingers across it, he felt it, he thought it was, you know, stitching and it didn't matter that it was glue because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, anything that you can feel so I should have just started out with one that didn't have a slip spot on its belly yeah and then just grooming is really important grooming make sure I've had people who started out competing and they didn't really think to shine a flashlight on the animal's eyes to clean off the paint so make sure that you're using flashlights on the eyes and the nose and the mouth 
all that stuff is super important. Those are really great points. You mentioned making the animal eye level. That's really good too. You don't want like a deer, you know, at chest level or something. You kind of want the face in your judge's face, basically. And then you also said grooming. The judge is going to take a flashlight all over your mouth. They're going to look in the nose, eyes, ears, everywhere. So that's really helpful before the show to do that yourself and make sure not only are all your, you know, pieces tight, but then also that you don't have like paint on your eyes, stuff like that. Another thing that's really important too is secure mount attachment. You don't want to see your mount attachment. You want to make sure that it's not wobbly. Mm, Good point. Because they'll definitely hit you for that. The stability. And of course, we didn't really talk about like DQs. You want to make sure your animal is dry. You want to make sure your animal doesn't stink. Uh, You're going to want to make sure that your animal is not vulgar in any type of way. You know, don't enter something vulgar and... Right, tasteful. And Yes, taste. You want your mouth to be tasteful. So those are things to keep in mind as well. Right, and DQ, like disqualified. You can be disqualified if you bring a mouth that's not dry all the way. Like it's still in the drying process and it might be wet or something. That's very possible. So it has to be a very completed mount. Yes, because it's somewhat unfair in a way if the mount is wet because things haven't really shrunken up how they would if they were dry so I'm assuming that that might be why they have it that way yeah and you know shrinkage takes in a huge portion of taxidermy the drying process like we're saying things can wrinkle on you all of a sudden that you don't expect drumming that's a huge issue when a mount is drying yeah yeah if you didn't have to worry about that it would make competing a lot easier (laughs) right (laughs) Just mount it up and there you go. Yeah, yeah, good to go. So um, I also wanted to just throw a little bit in here about the effort that it takes to put on these shows. I feel like it's something that's like so underrated and people don't realize the work that goes into it. I never really realized how much work goes into putting on a show until I became a board member for my state years ago. There are a lot of moving parts behind the scenes that go into a competition room the vendor supply area, the banquet, and just honestly trying to give the best experience possible for your members. So if you enjoy going to your state shows, don't be afraid to volunteer and help out where you can. I know at our show, a lot of times we look for volunteers to help with maybe selling raffle tickets or, you know, setting up, we have a cornhole tournament, you know, stuff like that. It's it's really nice for people to help out. And if you see somebody doing a good job, maybe just tell them thanks because it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, those are all great points too, because Heather, you have experience being on like the board and being a part of your association more than I do. So you really know how much it takes to put on the competition and how much work that you guys are doing and you don't get paid for that. It's pretty much volunteer based. And so you know, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, it shouldn't be taken lightly. Yeah, no, it's a, it is a lot, you know, as far as people you know, one, the online thing is, is one thing to make sure that you're getting everybody's info who's signing up for memberships all through the year and then getting all their info and making sure they're mailed stuff. And and I am in charge of ordering all of the awards and ribbons. And thankfully, the lady who used to do it provided me with a good good structure to go from. But, you know, you're ordering from this place and you're ordering from this place and you're getting donations from another place. And it's not like I never realized all that stuff goes on. You just think, poof, like there's the awards and there's the ribbons. But, you know, you're counting ribbons to see how many you have and how many you need. And like, huh, it's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I've never like personally helped out so much like at a show like you have. But yeah, I mean, there's the people on the board are running around like crazy the whole time. They're doing stuff constantly. They're making sure everything is working right. Everything is going smoothly. And so, yeah, like you said, just giving a simple like, thank you like hey you're doing a great job like that's that goes a long way yeah yeah that's why it's kind of nice going to other shows and then I just get to sit back and relax (laughs) that is nice (laughs) all right so here are some upcoming shows for the next few months if any of you are interested we have March shows there is the Montana Maryland Pennsylvania Virginia New York Illinois and Minnesota shows in April there is a show in Quebec in Wisconsin. Uh, in May, we have Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Nationals. In the month of June, there's West Virginia, Texas, Indiana, New England, and Oklahoma. And in July, we have Ohio. Um, I'm sure that we missed some shows, but 
We listed all that we could find online for now, and we will be sure to share more if we figure anything out in the future. I know it's kind of far out still, but Worlds, that's in August. So that's another show that's coming up this year. But yeah, of course, you know, there's so many shows just because we didn't list them doesn't mean they're not going on. Yeah, I and mean, just try to kind of incorporate the the upcoming months, you know, maybe in a episode a little closer to maybe maybe around nationals time can touch into anything in the end of the year. But most of the shows fall in the spring and summer. I, for one, prefer spring winter shows. Summer shows are fun, but it's so dang humid. I sweat my butt off when I'm carrying stuff into places. That nationals, Ashley, that we both went to in 20... 20- 22 i think it was in ohio 22 yep oh my gosh i was hot (laughs) yeah i and then like you said the humidity that's not good for mounts either because like when we talked to daniel he mentioned that show that he went to i think it was nationals that so many people's mounts were getting dq'd because of the humidity it was rehydrating everything yeah it's scary like i i worry i went to one in um west virginia in the summertime and it was so hot out it was so humid Uh, You know, first of all, their show is beautiful down there in the mountains. It is just, it's beautiful driving there, but so hot and humid. Like you step outside and you just immediately start sweating. And the whole time it was raining and I'm like, my mounts are going to get like, they're going to be wet feeling. My epoxy is going to crack, but it didn't, it didn't, but it is scary. Uh, So yeah, I think I prefer like a spring show as well. Usually the weather's a little nicer. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice though when they span them out too, but yeah, I don't really like the humidity and sweating it's just gross so. yeah lifting heavy mounts and <laughs> yes yeah and just then I I remember at nationals like I felt like I was, I was like sweating so much I just like felt like I stank and I'm like people stay away from me I don't don't come close to me I don't want to like just uh. I don't get, I don't want you to, if I stink don't smell me <laughs> right oh my gosh I totally understand that that's something and that's <laughs> That's another little thing too, though. If you, if you go into a grooming area, it's just a little gripe about my, my experiences. People want to talk to you when you're grooming your animal. Don't be afraid to be like, just wait, don't talk to me right now. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's, it can be a little bit distracting and yeah, you have every right to be like, Hey, can I talk to you after I'm done with this? Like, (laughs) that's a good point. Yeah. It is so distracting. It is so distracting because you do, you get, you're trying to finish up what you're doing and then you end up forgetting stuff and just, oh yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I feel like that about wraps up this week's episode and we hope that we shared some information that may help out some folks looking to get into competitions or maybe you already do compete and maybe this inspired you to put something together for this year's show. Yeah, we are definitely proponents of competitions. You know, we both compete but we would like to thank you for listening to our new podcast, Wildverse. If you would like to stay up to date on new episode releases, you can follow us on Facebook at Wildverse Taxidermy Podcast and Instagram at Wildverse Podcast. And also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Wildverse Podcast, to see when new videos come out. Or you can check out Wildverse on podbean.com to listen from your favorite apps. And please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.